Good morning, and welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church. We are grateful and thankful that you are here. When you enter the sanctuary, you should have been handed an order of worship. This order of worship will aid you in the worship of Almighty God. If you're joining us online, the order of worship is posted for you. There are two quick announcements that I want to draw your attention to. One is this. On uh, Thursday, March the 28th, we will be having a Monday, Thursday service. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Then we have Monday, Thursday, and then we'll have Easter Sunday. So just make note of that. Uh, the service will be at 6 o'clock on Thursday. I know some of you say it's a challenge to invite your friends to Sunday morning worship. Well, maybe invite them to this Thursday evening worship. Again, it's uh, Thursday, March the 28th at 6 o'clock. Also, just take note that we'll have a Foundations class weekend, April the 26th and 27th. We'll be going over to the foundations of our faith, and this is also if you'd like to join Covenant, this is a, a, a class that is required for you to take before you can join the church. I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey. I don't know the things that can and will prevent you from worshiping the true and living God, but this I do know, as he's called us together as his people this day to worship him. Let me ask you stand. As you stand, you're proclaiming to each other and to the watching world that Christ is risen. We're called to worship from Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. Listen to these words. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Note all these things. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. God Almighty, you are the maker of heaven and earth. And there are so many things that wants to distract us from the worship of you. May that not be so today. Maybe by the power of the Holy Spirit, be able to fix our eyes on you, Jesus. You deserve, you demand, and you command our worship May all the different elements of our worship service, the singing of the hymns, the confessions we sang, the reading of your word, the prayers, the preached word, may all of the different elements point us to your almighty throne. May we worship you well today. In the name of Jesus we pray. The one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we get to affirm our faith. We get to be reminded of what the Lord has done, is doing, and will do in our lives with the Apostles' Creed. If you will read along with me on page one. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, our only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you'll turn in your order of worship to page 2, you'll see that we are reading from the Westminster Confession, a larger catechism. As we have been working through this, we are reminded of not only that there is sin in our lives, but particularly what the punishment for sin is. And as we read these, we should, we should meditate and we should think on these things because it will also show us all the more of what grace has done, what the Lord is doing in our lives and the forgiveness of sins. So as I ask the question, if you'll respond by reading, what are the, punishment, what are the punishments for sin in this world? The punishments for sin in this world are either in order of blindness of the mind, reparate sense of strong delusion, hardness of heart, or of the conscience, vile afflictions, or outward and the curse of God upon the creatures of our sake, and all the evils that befall us in our bodies, names, estates, relations, employments, together with death itself. What are the punishments of sin in the world to come? The punishment of sins in the world to come are an everlasting separation from the comfort or peace of God and the most serious torments of the soul of the body without intermission in hell forever. You may be seated. If you'll join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the gospel. Lord, as we 
somewhat jovially think of St. Patrick's Day, when we think of the ways in which you have been moving throughout history, or we think of how you called a man uh, as he was brought into imprisonment, as he was made a slave into a different nation, Lord, and how you moved in his life, and how you allowed him to be able to, to be convicted that those that had captured him, those that enslaved him, needed to hear the good news of the gospel, Lord, and for him to go back. Lord, we're thankful for the ways in which you have gifted us with the good news of the gospel, how we've been able to, to go and be able to proclaim and make disciples and, and to see them baptized and see the Lord at work. Lord, we're thankful for the ways in which you have made us disciples. And so we, we pray that you would be with those all around the world that this morning are, are working through different hardships, they're working through different challenges uh, as they work to share the gospel, Lord, as they suffer through uh, persecution, as they suffer through physical trials, but also spiritual difficulties as, as they long to to see you more clearly. We pray that your spirit would continue to move and that you would do amazing things in your church, your bride. And Lord, as we think of the different nations in which you have raised up, Lord, we're thankful that you continue to rule and reign over all of them. We pray for the upcoming elections. Lord, we pray for peace in not only the United States, but all over the world. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to bring forth your gospel. Lord, we pray that there would be revival, that there would be a great awakening. And Lord, that there would be a returning to your word pray that you would be with uh, this local community, Lord, we pray that you would be with the first responders. We think of those that oftentimes find themselves in harm's way as they look to protect us and to uh, provide stability in, in this world. Lord, we pray that you'd be with the police officers. We pray that you'd be with the sheriff's department. We pray that you would give them great success in their endeavors. We also pray that you'd give them great wisdom and protection. We pray as well for the fire department, for those that firefighters that are out risking their lives to protect and to, to help uh, restore uh, those that are in oftentimes harm's way and, and need. Lord, we pray as well for EMTs and social workers that have uh, difficult circumstances where they have to go in and, and have discernment. We pray that you would give it to them. Lord, we also pray that you would be with this church. Lord, we're thankful for the ways in which you have blessed us in so many ways. We think of uh, Saturday and the ways in which it was able to to have a partnership with a lo another local church, um, or the one in Noonan, the Presbyterian Church there. We praise you for Marcus's hard work in that and the, the success of it for the youth being able to get together and to, to enjoy uh, the gifts of, of being able to run around, but also to encourage one another. We pray that you would continue to grow this ministry in the future, that there would be a greater connectionalism, not just in uh, the youth, but also in adults. And Lord, may we be reminded that, that this uh, church is, a, is part of a greater church. And Lord, as we think of uh, the church, we think of uh, the upcoming Holy Week, as Pastor Jamie has reminded us of the ability to be able to invite our neighbors and our friends and maybe those that we meet on the street or in a store. We pray that you would allow uh, there to be a great outpouring of, of the ability for those to come and worship you. We think of the Monday Thursday service and the mandate to love. Lord, we pray that you would remind us over and over again of, of what you've done uh, in the power of, of your word. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would be with this church and, and the people here. Lord, we're thankful for the many successful procedures recently. Lord, we think of many that are upcoming and, and those that are struggling with illnesses that are long-term. We pray that you would continue to be with family members and others as they support. May they build each other up. May we help share each other's burdens and pray for each other, but be an encouragement and, and be able to provide physical help as needed. Lord, we pray that you'd be with the expectant mothers. We pray that you would be with those that are mourning over loss, that, uh, that are struggling with the dark nights of the soul or the, the challenges of this fallen world. We pray that you would remind them of your, your loving care and your kindness. We pray that you would continue to protect them. We do ask that you would be with your word and pray that you would be with Pastor Jamie as he continues to open it up, as he continues to proclaim the difficulties uh, in these passages, but Lord, we pray that the Spirit would move and that you would continue to use him as an instrument in our lives and in the lives of this church. Lord, we do ask that you would be with us as we are given the opportunity to give a tithe and an offering to you. Lord, may we remi be reminded of how blessed we are as a people. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. As we take up our morning offering, let us be reminded by Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. If the ushers will come forward to take an offering.
you'll pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the blessings that you've poured out upon us. We pray that you would be with this offering, Lord, that the monies from it would be used for your glory, Lord, that they would be a tool used to bring forth the gospel to faraway lands, but also, Lord, that they'd be used to, to do small things around here that turn into big things for you. Lord, we pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. Let me ask that you take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 12, verse 38. Are you looking at verses 38 through 45? Jesus makes it clear in our text this morning that there is something greater than Jonah, something greater than Solomon. Both Jonah and Solomon are great, but who is greater? It's Jesus. Jesus is greater, and that is the point of our text. Look at verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will, will it be with this evil generation. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, moments ago we sang that we stand beneath the cross of Jesus. That is indeed where we stand. We are beneath the cross. And we hold high your word. We know that it is your word that you've given to your people as a, as a great gift. The reminder of what you have done, but also, Father, as your word to your people. And so may we come humbly and yet boldly to your word this morning. You are worthy to be praised. We pray that as we look at your word, indeed, you would penetrate our hearts with your truth. For this is for your glory and our good. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. If I was to retitle this sermon, or if I ever re-preach this sermon again, I will probably change the title to something to the effect of, How Dare You? And typically, I submit my text and my titles to Liz. She has it out through the end of June right now, so I could have changed it, uh, to be fair. But the reality is, I didn't really come to that conclusion until about Thursday of this week. Thursday or Friday, and Liz already sends everything to, to the print by that point, and so I didn't. But if I was going to, it would be, how dare you? And here is why. I don't know if, if anyone has ever said this to you. How dare you ask such a question, or, or how dare you think this way or that way? Uh, I've received that growing up from my parents sometimes, uh, but I would ask them a question. How dare you ask such a question, right? The Pharisees have witnessed the truth of Jesus. They have seen Jesus at work. They understand who Jesus is. They don't like Jesus, but they understand who Jesus is. And then they ask Jesus a question. It's almost like the gall of the Pharisees to ask of such a question of Jesus. When I was in uh, taking Hebrews in uh, seminary, the, uh, the, the language Hebrew, when I, Dr. Gilchrist was my professor. He taught at Covenant College as well as Covenant Theological Seminary. He said this, when we read numbers in Scripture... They're there for a reason, right? God doesn't waste our time. He doesn't waste his word. And so they're there for a reason, but we need to be slow with assigning specifics to those numbers. Sometimes we could assign proper uh, uh, conclusions to those numbers, and sometimes we may mislead ourselves if we try to assign certain things to those numbers. In our text this morning, we have two instances about numbers. One, we have great clarity of what it means. One, not so much. Jesus says about Jonah being three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish. Well, we know what that is pointing to. Because Jesus tells us what that is pointing to. It's pointing to the time that Jesus will be three days and three nights in the tomb. But then at our last section that we'll be looking at today, uh, there are, there's a, a, an evil spirit. And then this evil spirit goes off and finds seven other evil spirits. And some people, some commentators, some folks that we like, trying to make a big deal about the number seven. Now, I get it. I understand what we believe and what we say the number seven represents in Scripture, which is completion or perfection. We get that from Genesis. God created the heavens and the earth in six days. It was complete. It was perfect. And what did God do on the seventh? He rested. So I understand the ideal there, but look at the text again. There's a spirit who leaves, and the spirit goes and finds seven other spirits who then come back. So actually, there's eight spirits there, not just seven. And so we want to be slow about assigning what these seven represent. I would also submit to you, church, that I don't think, right, these spirits are representing completion or or perfection uh, by no means. And so let's just be slow with that. The religious leaders continue to dispute with Jesus. You may recall when we began looking at chapter 12 weeks ago, we read, we read conflict after conflict after conflict with Jesus and the religious leaders. Their conflict is just growing and growing. In Matthew 12, 14, uh, Matthew says, But the Pharisees went out and conspired. They, they plotted against him, against Jesus, how they might destroy him. Some of your scriptures may have it translated as how they might kill him. Last week we looked at Jesus when he, he called the religious leaders a brood of vipers. They were spewing lies, not just lies, but deadly lies. Jesus called them the offspring of evil. This is pretty harsh name calling. And it's on the hills of Jesus rebuking them, on the hills of that, that some of the Pharisees, and I think Matthew is intentional here, it's some of the Pharisees make some request of Jesus. Again, this is where I would say, how dare you Pharisees? Look at verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Now, at the, the beginning of this week, as I was beginning to, to study, my heart was pretty hard toward that request. It's like, who, who do they think they are? I mean, we know the Pharisees. We read the Pharisees. They know who they are. They know the jealousy, the hatred that they have for Jesus. They know what they've been doing. Who do they think they are? They were there. They, they saw Jesus. They, they watched Jesus, what he did. They heard Jesus, what he said. And they did everything they could 
by their actions as well as by their words to stop Jesus. And now in the midst of Jesus rebuking them, really calling them to the carpet, they want to flip the script on Jesus, don't they? They ask Jesus for a sign. Again, who do they think they are? And, and do they really think? See, here's where my heart was kind of hard toward the Pharisees. Do they really think they can play Jesus? Like they, could, they can manipulate Jesus. They can act like, look how pious we are, Jesus. Okay, we've, we've received your rebuke, and now we, want to, uh, now we really want to submit to you, right? I'm not going to lie, church. I'm not defending the Pharisees here. We know their hearts and desires concerning Jesus. We know that they are dead wrong. And short from the redeeming grace of Jesus, they are damned. But how many times, how many times have we done the same thing? We know the truth. And how many times have we asked, Lord, if you are really real, then give me a sign. Show me something. Lord, if you really love me, if you really care for me, you know I need you to make yourself do something extra special for me. Church, we have God's word. We should praise the Lord for that. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. The Lord has equipped us. The Lord has given his church what the divines call the means of grace, which is how the Lord Jesus ordinarily grows our faith not a surprise to you you've heard these means of grace before uh, spoken from this pulpit it's prayer uh, both private prayer as well as corporate prayer it's the word again praise the lord we have god's complete word from genesis to revelation it's right here you have it if you don't have a bible grab a few bible and take it home with you god ordinarily grows his people through his word through private and personal reading and studying of scripture and through the preaching of God's word in public worship, through the sacraments, the Lord's Supper, and baptism. They're all part of how uh, the Lord ordinarily grows his people. And all three of those, prayer, word, and sacrament, are part of public worship. It's one of the reasons why it's important that we gather together as God's people on the Lord's Day to worship the true and living God and to submit ourselves to these means of worship, of grace. It's another reason, church, why sometimes we'll pray this way. We need to work hard at our worship. How easy is it, church? How easy is it that we easily get distracted, either from our neighbor around us or from the things happening in the world or from our own mind and our own heart? We easily get distracted. We need to avail ourselves of these means as often as we can. So let me ask you, church, are you in a pit of despair? Do you feel like you're on a desert or you're in a desert, a dry place with your spiritual walk? Our tendencies when we get there is to walk away from these means and we ask for something different. But the Lord God Almighty has given his people what we need. He knows what we need. Whatever your situation is, church, the Lord is aware. The Lord is at work. Church, we must be faithful to the means of grace that he's given to his people to grow our faith. Some of the Pharisees answered. Some of the Pharisees replied to Jesus. And remember what they are responding to Jesus. Uh, Jesus, last week we looked at this, Jesus called them a brood of vipers. Uh, Jesus said, how can you speak good when you are evil? Pharisees heard that and they responded and they asked for a sign. And when we read the word sign in scripture, we may think of miracle. And I understand why you may think that one, the word miracle is not in scripture. We may think that, but, but a sign, and it's the case here as we'll see, the context clues, the way in which Jesus uses this word as well. The word sign is a visible event that points to something else, that points to something greater as it does in our text. Jesus says, but, but he answered them, Matthew says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. You see, church, We may be able to manipulate those 
around us. We may be able to give the perception of piety, but we cannot fool Jesus. The Pharisees could not fool Jesus. Jesus understood the reasoning for wanting a sign that it was not to validate his authority. They wanted a sign to test and to discredit Jesus. Let us heed this warning and examine our own hearts, ensuring that our pursuit of God is rooted in faith, and not in our desires for selfish gain or selfish motivation. Jesus says, Matthew said that Jesus said, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And we could look at this in two different ways. One would be, it could be a sign that Jonah gave, right? That could be one way. Or the other way, which is the way in which we're going to take it, is a sign that is Jonah himself. Now, if you were in adult Sunday school class about three or so weeks ago, you know the answer. Jonah himself is the sign At some point, if you haven't done so recently, go and read the story of Jonah. Jonah is a very short story of four chapters. Uh, You may be familiar with the story of Jonah. If not, that's okay. Go and study and read Jonah. You have the benefit of God's, again, one of the means of grace. You have the benefit of God's word to go and to read the story of Jonah. You may know Kind of one of the familiar things about Jonah is he was swallowed by a great fish. Interesting enough, and you would know this as well, particularly if you were in Sunday school, but you may know this as well as your own studies. Sometimes we think of the story and we think of, the, of Jonah getting swallowed up by the great fish as the judgment of God against Jonah. But actually, church, the great fish for Jonah was his salvation. It was his rescue. It was his redemption. The judgment was Jonah getting thrown overboard, and he was drowning, actively drowning in the sea. And it was the great fish that came and swallowed up Jonah and rescued him, saved him from drowning. And then the great fish vomited him out on dry ground. Jonah is a sign because he lived three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. And then when he came out and he began... Uh, and and, and uh, when he came out and he emerged alive in Nineveh, Jonah gained a hearing in that godless place. So he proved he was God's messenger. Jesus declares that he will be in the grave the same amount of time that Jonah was in the belly of the great fish. He goes on to say that Nin- the Ninevites repented in the face of Jonah's preaching. And then in verse 41, Behold, And the very important word there, behold, look, pay attention, see, something greater than Jonah is here. The story of Jonah is a big deal. The religious leaders ask for a sign. The sign of Jonah has been given to point to something greater. The sign of Jonah points to Jesus himself. The religious leaders, unlike the Ninevites, the religious leaders rejected Jesus. And in rejecting Jesus, they were rejecting the one who sent Jesus. I don't want to be too uh, unnecessarily offense, offensive with my next question for you. So don't let me be. And if you are, then I would love to have a conversation with you uh, after the worship service. The Lord God Almighty gave the Pharisees, the sign of Jonah. And they rejected the sign of Jonah. Jonah should grow our faith. The religious leaders' faith should have grown with the understanding of who God Almighty is. Well, what about us, church? Do you reject the means of grace that the Lord God Almighty has given to his people to grow our faith? Again, the religious leaders wanted a sign. They had a sign of Jonah. They wanted their faith to grow. Do you reject the means that God has given his church? Prayer, word, and sacraments. Is that you? I mean, how many times, how many conversations have I had with folks? Well, we don't want the means of grace to become commonplace. No, they should, church. They should become commonplace. So common that when we don't do them, you miss it. You miss it. 
Now, I understand there's a whole argument there, and we're not going to get into it here, but the Lord's Supper weekly, I would argue it's proper and good weekly to have the Lord's Supper ever before us. But it's a means of grace that the Lord has given his church to grow our faith. Are you asking the Lord to do something great? Are you asking the Lord to give you a sign to make himself known? Well, my follow-up question is, are you, church, submitting yourself to the means of grace? Just like as Jonah brought the truth of God regarding repentance and salvation to the Ninevites, so does Jesus bring, bring the same message of salvation. One more thing I want to point out in verse 41. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Some of your translations may have pronounced sentence on. Why? Why will the sons of the Ninevites rise up? For they repented. They repented of their evil. They believed God and they showed their remorse and they worshiped God Almighty. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. If we can, just for a moment, I want to take a little bit of a rabbit trail. Again, I'd encourage you to go and to read Jonah in its entirety. In Jonah 3, verse 10, we read, When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. That fits perfectly with our verse of the year in Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifice of God is a broken a spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. Church, do you have a humble, broken heart before God? The answer is either yes or it is no. There is no neutral ground. The people at Nineveh, didn't, at Nineveh did have a humble, broken, contrite heart. But the religious leaders here in Matthew did not. Verse 42. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she has came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And we know from 1 Kings 10 that the queen of the south is also the, is, is the queen of Sheba. And we know that she came to test Solomon with hard questions, much like the religious leaders have been doing with Jesus. The difference is she sought truth and was willing to accept Solomon's wisdom. And 1 Kings 10, 1 says, Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. And a little bit later in that same chapter, we read in verses 6 and 7, And she said to the king, The report was true. That I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. But I did not believe the report until I came and my own eyes heard, had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpasses the report that I heard. So at the final judgment, Jesus says, the queen of the south will rise up also to bear witness against this generation. The generation of Jesus' day and condemn it. And again, Matthew says, and behold. And I know every time I read that word, I make a big deal. And maybe it's just where I am. Maybe it's just I know my own heart, my own head, that I need to be reminders. And this is one of those indicators to perk up, to look, to pay attention. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Who is greater, church? It's not a trick question. Who is greater? It's Jesus. For the people uh, during the time of Matthew, during the time of Jesus, the Pharisees, Jesus is in their midst, and they are missing it. They're missing it. Our next section, the next uh, verses, starting verse 43, concerns me. One, there's a mystery here. We've kind of already talked about the, the, the mystery. There's the mystery of, of, of the why seven spirits. But that's not the part that concerns me, to be honest, church. The part that concerns me is actually what is clear in our text. It's the clarity of our text that concerns me. Look again at those verses, 43 through 45. When the unclean spirit says, go out of a person, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. Here's why this, these verses concern me. An unbeliever, that Jesus is talking about a person, it's an illustration, he's talking about a person. An unbeliever can get their life in check, can't they? 
an unbeliever can make the decision to clean up their life, to get it in order. I have some friends over the years who've been alcoholics, who've been, uh, who's, who's been a drug, uh, addicted to drugs, who's been addicted to porn, and they made a decision. I'm going to start living a, a pure, clean life. I'm going to get over it. And they do, and sometimes it's because of fam- their family situation changed. I have a friend of mine, a good friend of mine in high school, who was uh, very much known as a drug addict, and, and uh, he called me, this was years ago, but he called me and he, he was getting clean, and the reason why he was getting clean was because he was about ready to have a baby. You know, how many of us can attest that, that babies, children, make you do things, right? They make you get in line, they clean up, right? Which is a good thing. So an unbeliever can get their, their life in check. They can, they can live a pure life. They can leave it, uh, say, I want to leave it, live a clean life. I want to start living the, the straight and narrow. And, and again, sometimes it's because of a life or death situation that an unbeliever makes that decision. Jesus' illustration speaks of a person who seemingly, right, seemingly have gotten his life cleaned up. But he makes the point that the person is empty, meaning that the person is not demon-filled, this person also does not have the indwelling Holy Spirit either. This person is just empty, seemingly leaving a, a leaving, leading a clean, healthy life. But this person is empty. They're void of the spirit of demons, void of the, of the Holy Spirit. One commentator said this, this passage warns everyone, but especially the crowds, that heart that half-hearted reform and faith will never suffice. If partial reform drives out a demon, the house must not stand empty. A new master must take up residence. A new light must shine there. Then he will be free. In this illustration, the demon left, but then the demon returns with seven other demons that are more powerful than the first demon that left. This person is worse off than the last state that person was in. And here is the connection. Jesus so also will it be with this evil generation. Jesus is returning to verse 39 and shows that Jesus is warning the religious leaders. They resemble a house occupied by seven wicked spirits. That is why they do Satan's work. Like Satan, they tempted Jesus to perform spectacular signs, to dodge the cross. You may recall after Jesus uh, when Jesus began his earthly ministry and he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, what did Satan do? He says, turn these stones into bread. He tempted Jesus. He took Jesus up on a high mountain and says, hey, throw yourself down. Uh, legions of angels will come and protect you. What was Satan tempting Jesus to do? To dodge the cross. Like Satan, they plotted, the, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders plotted to kill Jesus. The Puritan, John Owen, Speaking on the necessity of true repentance said, said this, that the seed of every sin is in every heart, and every sin would grow to the utmost if it were not hindered by grace. So what is the conclusion of the matter before us this morning? Let us not deceive ourselves with superficial piety, but let us earnestly seek the transforming power of God's grace to uproot sin from our hearts completely. I cannot be more concerned for your soul than you are concerned for your soul, right? I can preach truth, say truth, I can encourage you in the truth, I can encourage you in in the word of the Lord, but if you care less, well, man, that's on you. That's not on me. And I know you want to think that it's the reverse of that, but that's not on me. That is on you. If you think that you are above God's word, if you think that you are above God's means that he has given his church, again, my friend, that is on you. That is not on me. The Pharisees saw truth, heard truth, was confronted with the truth of Jesus, but they could care less. And that was on them. And judgment was coming. What about you, church? Church, I would say we are living in some of the best of times of church history. We are living with the understanding of the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. There is no greater sign than the resurrected Jesus. We do not need to ask the Lord for a sign. We need to ask the Lord to help us with our unbelief. I received an email a few weeks ago from someone who was struggling. It wasn't that they were struggling with their faith in Christ. They truly believed that truth. 
They believed in the resurrection of Jesus. That truth was real and true to them, but they struggled with unbelief. Lord, help me with my unbelief. See, church, sin and sin struggles are real, but we must know the truth is Jesus is greater than our sin and our sin struggles. Because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, sin and the grave has been defeated. I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey, but regardless of where you are, Jesus is greater. In Christ, we are set free from the penalty of our sin and made righteous. We need to cling to that hope. We need to cling to that truth. If you're an unbeliever and you're with us today, I'm thankful and grateful that you're here. It's not by accident that you're here. If you're online listening to us, it's not by accident that you're hearing what you're hearing today. But don't just hear the truth of Jesus, but ask the Holy Spirit to enable you to believe. Ask the Holy Spirit to enable you to repent and to trust Jesus. Let's pray. Good Lord Jesus, we can... Let our loved ones think that we have it all together. But you know where we are. You know the mess that we are. You know our hearts better than we know our own hearts. We may be able to even act all pious and humble and and holy. But the truth could be, Father, that we are so far from that truth. We may be able to fool our loved ones. We may be able to fool our church. Maybe we've done it for years. But as we see in our text this this morning, we cannot fool you. So will you draw us to your throne? Draw us to your grace. Maybe fix our eyes on you, Jesus. The author and perfecter. And perfecter of our faith. Our faith in you is all about you. It's all about your work. It's all about what you have accomplished. May we cling to that truth. May we cling to that hope that is in you, Lord Jesus. Lord, if there's some of, someone in our mix today, today is the day that they come to a realization that they have never repented, that they've never believed. May today be the day of salvation for them. May they repent. May they believe. For your glory and for our good. For it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>
reminder, we have evening worship at 5.30. Pastor Adam will be working through Genesis 41. All of you are encouraged to come back, to sit under the preached word, and to come to the Lord's Supper. We'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper this evening, and, and we need the table. I get it. Some of you are hindered from coming. That's understandable. Some of you maybe just need a little extra nudge for you to come uh, for evening worship. Christian, look up. Receive the Lord's benediction. May, now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. May you go in peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.